Salam. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay. We're all here. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening. Good evening. Um, we'll just give it a minute um, so that we have more people that are joining the uh, joining the webinar. So in, in a minute, I will go ahead to introduce our topic and then we can take it from there, inshallah. Inshallah. Good numbers. Okay, we'll begin. Since all of our guests are here, I'm sure as we continue, people will, will come in and uh, and we'll also have this on live on uh, YouTube after the webinar, inshallah. Okay, good evening once again uh, to everybody watching. Uh, to my esteemed uh, guests, thank you so much for joining this uh, webinar on an extremely important uh, topic. Today we're going to be talking about uh, sexual violence and rape, converting anger to action. Um, as we all know, uh, this is a, a, an extremely important topic that uh, we felt like we needed to um, get to the right minds uh, to come and discuss. So there's a lot of very interesting things we're going to cover today. And inshallah, at the end of this webinar, we're also going to be listing uh, organizations, uh, active organizations that people can join and also support uh, that are working in line with this, um, with this topic. So Without wasting any more time, I'm going to go ahead to introduce uh, our wonderful guest today. Um, I'll start with uh, Hajiya Fatima Hamza. Hajiya Fatima is joining us as an educator that is the head of Al Amana Academy in Kaduna State. Uh, she is also the former Honorable Commissioner of Women Affairs and Social Development in Jigawa State. Uh, she's also the former Executive Director finance at Tutan Institutes Nigeria Limited. So you're welcome, Hajiya Fatima Hamza. Thank you so much for the time that you're uh, dedicating to us today. And we look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, uh, so next I'll be introducing Hajiya Saada Liman, who is uh, coming to us as a renowned and reputable scholar. She is a lecturer in the Department of Islamic Studies, Nasarawa State University, Kefi. Uh, she's also the first indigenous professor of Islamic studies in the department. She's also the first professor of Islamic studies in Nasarawa State and the first female professor of Islamic studies in the North Central. So, Hajiya uh, Saada to Hassan, thank you so wow. much for joining us. We are very honored uh, to have you here and we look forward to hearing from your uh, well-learned uh, and knowledgeable opinion. Um, I think you're muted, so you have to unmute yourself. Okay, thank you very much and thank you for having me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Okay, and then lastly, I'll be introducing my sister uh, Ms. Rukaya Iyai, she's the founder of MAQ Mac Foundation for Substance Abuse Prevention and Mental Health Awareness. She's also uh, been technically assisting the Office of the Vice President on Sexual and Gender-Based Violence. Um, I know Rukaya to also have experience, you know, speaking to a lot of young women uh, on their experiences uh, uh, with uh, gender-based violence and rape. So she's going to be uh, giving us her insights from that perspective. Um, I myself, I'm Aisha Shraibu. I'm going to be the moderator of this uh, seminar. So once again, uh, welcome everybody and uh, we'll get right to it. 
Okay, so uh, the first thing that I just want to touch on before I uh, uh, before I take it to, to you, our speakers today, is um, I want us to kind of reflect on uh, the societal contributions of uh, the the societal contributing factors um, to uh, sexual violence and rape, uh, and I mean this um, um, along the perspective of the of the abusers themselves, of the predators, these people. What are those um, societal factors around us that are contributing to uh, this problem? And why I'm saying societal factors is because we don't factor, a lot of times we're, we're, we focus on the victims, we focus on the stories, we focus on what has occurred without actually going to the root of the problem. Now, sexual violence and rape is something that has been happening since the beginning of time. What is the reason why we are talking more about it today? We're not talking about it today because it is just happening. We're talking about it today because um, there, is a, there, there are more stories being shared almost every single day. We are seeing it, even those that have never heard about rape cases, that have never heard about abuse cases, every single day we hear about a, a, a case. And for those that have been victims, it, it's a trigger. And for those that have not been victims, but have only been aware of this issue, it's, it's, it just, it, it brings about a sort of emotion. So, you know, bring, coming back to the purpose of this, uh, uh, a webinar where we want to convert that emotion that you feel from these stories to action. So uh, what are the societal um, contributing factors to the, to the, to the, uh, the, the predators uh, and what is it that leads to, to these issues exactly? I'll just, I'll throw this to anybody that wants to contribute before I begin to ask uh, you all individually. Okay. okay. I think why, why we really hear about the issues now is because of access and availability of information. And um, I think the culture of, we are breaking the culture of the silent treatment, which is we are, like we are scratching the surface of that. And I'm really proud of that because 10 years ago, no girl would come out and say she's been raped or anything. But right now online, we could see people telling their stories because it's kind of a safe space. And the anonymity of you telling the story is not really open to everyone. So I think um, why we hear about more cases now than before, it's not like it wasn't happening before, is because there is access and availability of information, particularly um, on social issues in general. But I think um, um, the reason why there is this things happening in society is because I will still go back to the culture of silent of silence. Um, why the um, predators find it very comfortable doing what they do is because they they silent their victims from speaking up through manipulations. You know, so um, I think that's why a lot of activists are trying to work towards breaking the silent treatment. And if you see something, say something kind of thing. And if it happens to you, you are safe. I think um, there is so much work to be done there because there is a lot of stigma, again, attached to it. When you speak about it, that is the stigma is definitely on the victim. The, the lady being raped than the, even the rapist. So I think it's a general thing, like um, I said earlier, the silent treatment and the culture of, of, um, of silence and then the stigma. That's what I think. That's what, why the, that is, the predators are very comfortable doing what they do. Thank you, Rukai. I had your particular Okay, I was the Bilahim in Shaitan Rajim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, in Alhamdulillah, Nahmadu, who want to stay in, want to stay the Firu. When I was the Bilahim in Shururi and Fusina, I was say Yati Amalina, and Yahadilla for La Mudilla, or my Yudlin, La Hadilla. Why shed one la ila in the la, Wahda Hula Shadi Kala, why shed one Muhammad and Abdul Rasulu Mabad, Salam Alaikum, Rahmatullah, who barakatu. So I salam. Yeah, Rahmatullah, who barakatu. So if you remember, um, Aisha, when you came to me, really, I'm, I'm so happy that this is all about action, you know, but of course, before we begin to talk about action, we need to reflect a bit and see how we 
got here. So um, I don't know if you can still hear me. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So um, most important of all, what matters is matching words with action. Very, very important. So um, change happens because of a committed uh, minority or committed few. So very, very important. So the problems in general is number one. We have spiritual bankruptcy, honestly. Um, if only we would all uh, act according to the teachings of the Quran and um, the, the teachings of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Presently, the Ummah is very weak because of a chain of weaknesses. Um, there is disconnection between us, his slaves, and Allah, our creator. There's neglect of Salah. There's poverty of the stomach, poverty of the mind, poverty of the spirit, you know? All we're doing is following our heart's desires. There's very high moral decadence, you know, a lot of injustices. So basically what has happened is Shaitan has taken over through these weaknesses. What he does is he preys on our weaknesses. So wherever there is, that's, uh, he takes over there. So rape is a very, very heinous crime, you know, gross injustice to the women folk and the children as well, because it's happening to the children a lot. And allowing these things to go unchecked it's even yeah. worse. Yeah. So we all know as a society, um, mm -hmm. any society that is built on injustice is not going to go anywhere. It's not going to succeed. So it is moments of sinful pleasure for the perpetrator, but a lifetime of pain, misery, you know, stigma, psychological torture for the victim. You know, so these people are spiritually sick and are evil and the evil must be eliminated. It must be done away with. Then secondly, you have the issue of mindset. You know, it's like, it's a systemic thing, you know. Um, it's a mindset issue. Bunch of factors working together to keep the status quo. So the way and manner, first of all, in which, you know, the society perceives women is a foundational problem. So unless and until we change the way we see women, you know, we're not going to begin to tackle this problem. And then second, we're being held hostage by this problem. And, and what I mean by that is the, the, you know, limiting beliefs that we have in this atrocious culture. So... It is a culture filled by silence, like she rightly said, you know, fear of shame, stigma, blame, blaming the victim instead of the perpetrator. It's a patriarchal society, you know, uh, where we believe erroneously that it's a man's world. They do no wrong, you know. So we made a mistake from the beginning of allowing this problem to thrive. And when we allow young people to flourish in social ills, they continue into old age. And this is what we're reaping today. So because it's a culture not checked, we go about the problem unperturbed, pretending as if it's not there. It has grown into a full-blown pandemic, threatening the backbone of our society, bringing us down to our knees. Then we have a breakdown of law and order. There's indiscipline um, in terms of the followership. There's distrust between the followers and the governance that we have today. So hardly any punishment is meted out. Instead, victims are blamed and, and, and perpetrators go scot-free. You know, then there's also an issue of ignorance. No consequences. Not, yes, not knowing our rights, not knowing the Islamic view, you know. So rape or any sexual act in Islam is a heinous crime, a grievous sin, because you're forcefully, violently, violently stealing a person's dignity, you know. So uh, you're stealing a person's happiness, innocence, you know. It's an invasion of privacy, entering with force, where you should not without Allah's permission. It is banditry the stealing of dignity, you know? So you're killing someone, but allowing them to live and keep, they keep reliving this experience, you know? Some till the end of their lives, you know? They live with depression, they're suicidal. It's a traumatic experience, you know? So it's like you're fighting humanity with a disturbance. It's, it's a disturbance of public peace, you know? So this makes it a facade, spreading corruption on earth. There are many verses in the Quran that tells us that Allah does not like those who spread corruption on earth. You know, and the sanctity of preserving the human life, human dignity is so important that disrupting peace through facade is met with very, very harsh punishment, as we can see in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 32, 33. And, you know, again, I keep repeating this, that distinguishing, distinguishing feature, you know, that um, a woman has, you know, that makes her feminine is her womb. And Allah honored her womb with his name and attribute, a rahim you know, a Rahman from a Rahman, a Rahim. So through the sacred place, prophets, you know, scholars, humankind, and rape is an invasion of this uh, place, 
it's an act of violence. So how do you think Allah sees all this, you know? And then we also have the issue of men's attitude uh, with all due respect to our men folk. But I'm um, talking generally, that is just a sweeping generalization there. We have very, very good men out there. But honestly, sometimes we... I think we've lost her. Ajia Fatima, can you hear us? I think her network is a bit unstable. Okay, so um, while we wait for her network to stabilize a bit more, is it just from my side or can everybody else? Hajia Fatima, can you hear us? Assalamu alaikum. I'm sorry, we lost you. Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay, I'm back, right? Yeah, you're back. Oh, okay. So, so bottom line, you know, the, the, the uh, attitude of men. So, uh, so what we really need from you, you know, um, you know, we just need your actions. We need, we need you to help with your action, not with your comments, your opinions and quotations, you know, so, so bottom line. And then failing to make connections, the root causes, you know, uh, it does not take a genius to tell you that pornography is closely linked to this menace. We need to wake up, honestly, because many people are watching indecency it has been happening for a long time and it is still happening and it is on the increase last year there were there were 42 billion visits to pornographic websites you can imagine what this year is like with this um, lockdown and so on and so forth and then the big one failed parenting failed parenting honestly parents are not present parents are no more role models you know we cannot fail to parent our children and expect the school and the society to perform magic the most difficult thing children have to go through today is we expect good manners from them, but they are not seeing any from us, you know? So again, it's also a culture fueled by fear, denial, you know, blame factor, covering for the perpetrator, the family members covering up, you know? And the blame is represented on the perpetrator. So silence, shame, ignorance, injustice, and so on and so forth. So I'll stop there. I've said a lot, and then there's a lot to be said as well. But really, basically, these Thank are. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, uh, uh, Rukai, I'm going to come to you now. I would like you to discuss uh, from a psychological perspective, based on your experiences working with the victims. Mm -hmm. um, I remember very uh, vividly a story that you had told me one time that shook me to my core. A long time ago, a conversation about a, a lady that you had spoken to. And I was in, I was, I was, it was, it was so uh, difficult to process uh, that um, experience that you had with this person because uh, it's hard to believe that you have victims that are victims and don't even realize they're victims. Uh, yeah. And then of course, there's also the psychological perspective from the predators and rapists themselves. So please uh, give mm -hmm. us an insight based on your experiences, the psychological contributing factors to rape and sexual abuse in our society from the perspective of the victim and the abuser as well. Yeah, so I think from last year, like last two years, I've been really working on sexual and gender-based violence. And even with my NGO, the plan was this year to start working on why there is high rise in women taking substances in our society, particularly in Northern Nigeria. Because a lot of women that comes to you one way or the other, like 10 out of, um, seven out of 10, leads, um, one of their problems is they've been sexually abused, either by a close relative or, it's always a close relative. So sometimes they can't sleep or just like the, the a case like that was terrible. She was being abused by someone close to her, her dad. And she never thought, she thought it was normal until she's like 16. She realized that this is not normal. And when he stopped coming to her, she misses it and wanted him back. So she started not eating because she, so she started developing eating disorder in order to look 
more attractive to him because she thinks she was fat. So, I mean, the, the pre uh, predators, they have manipulative ways of making you feel like, not like the victim, but making you even be guilty of not coming to them. And you on the other side, you're having all this, all these emotions, uncertainty, you're not sure. Is it right? He said, I shouldn't tell. How will I go about it? All the un, unanswered questions, you all have them on your mind. And that alone keeps them awake at night. So like a lot of them get into substances. It starts with just maybe taking a sleeping tablet and then getting addicted to it. Then from there, one doesn't work. One, um, maybe two tablets, but doesn't work they add to four from there to six like I have been I have come um, in contact with a girl that takes 12 Panadol nights and two bottles of codeine to sleep and this same girl too has been abused even though she's been married but it still haunts her because it's from a very close relative and she's still feeling guilty for telling someone in the family and then there has been a family crisis. So I think if um, most victims are not believed because a lot of the predators relatives are trying to cover it up because of the image of the family. I'm talking about family and, and, and sexual abuse because it's very, very common. 70% of sexual abuse or rape is from someone close to you, either friends or family. So um, that's why I'm giving examples. So you don't really, and when they do it, you can't talk about it because you don't want to be the center of the problem. The stigma goes back to you. You, you the, all the faults, people always find for, fault in you. What was she wearing? Why would you go to the room? When he called you, why didn't you say no? Why didn't you run away? Why do you have to go to him? You know, every question. So I mean, I mean, um, we need to like really give attention to the victims, listen to them, believe them. If they can describe a horrible thing to you, then it has to be true. Don't even question them. For me now, I have learned I'm so emotional sometimes is faulty because I don't question the victims. If you tell me, then there has to be an atom of truth. And then we're in it together. You know what I mean? And for me, I don't think, I pray to Allah that if I find myself, because first and foremost, all of us, like she rightly said, um, Mrs. Fatima said, like the, the ummah is weak. It's so weak. Things have, things are really, really bad. So for us now, first and foremost, as a Muslim, I'm an ambassador to Islam. And if I'm ambassador, what do I do to prevent, to protect the image of Islam? Not my family image, not my image. What will I do to protect Islam image? Because already things are bad. We all give not we, I mean, but we Muslims give Islam a bad name. We've given it a rotten name already that the religion is no more attractive because of what we do, how we cover things off, the, the, the shame culture, you know, the stigma culture. We have given Islam so much bad names that they see it as an oppressive religion when there is no religion that has liberated women like this beautiful deen. So as a, as a Muslim, the first thing I do is, okay, first of all, as a Muslim, things are bad. What do I do? Damage control. I need to control the damage. And how do I do it in my little way? I can't, I can't come out and, and fight jihad on all the rapists, you know, but how do I do it in my little space? And that's first is supporting the victims, helping them from their addiction, realizing they are worth it, giving them a voice, a choice, and worth. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for that <laughs> contribution. Um, I'll take it now to um, Hajiya Sa'ada to Hassan Liman. Uh, Hajiya Sa'ada, please, I'd like you to give us a perspective from, from faith. Um, 
rape is not a Muslim problem. However, in Northern Nigeria, which is predominantly Muslim, and we've spoken a lot today about how our religion views, um, uh, you know, rape and abuse and how, uh, you know, if you, if you know Islam well, you know that uh, we have been honored uh, by Allah himself in the Quran and we've been elevated to a very high level and a high pedestal. And women have rights over men just as how uh, men have rights over women. However, uh, in Northern Nigeria, particularly recently, especially, we have seen an escalated uh, a number of cases coming out of the North. And this is supposed to be a predominantly Muslim uh, part of the country, right? So this is clearly not a Muslim problem. This is a people problem, it's a societal problem. And I say this also for the benefit of those that have tuned in that are not Muslim, so that uh, you can also give the, because you know so many people are wrong about uh, our faith and we need to be able to publicly come out and say, no, this is not a Muslim problem. This is a general problem that we have to come together to collaborate in eradicating. So please give us, uh, I would like you to just talk a bit on, on that. And then uh, secondly, I'd like you to also touch on evil whispers that uh, uh, abusers and rapists blame their actions on. Because a lot of predators, they, they just say, oh, you know, there's an evil force that is speaking in my ear. There's a, I had a dream or there's a feeling or something. What do you have to say about people like that? So please start from, from anywhere. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Audhu billahi sameel alim minash shaitani rajeem. Bismillahi rahmani rahim. Rabbi shrali sadri wa yassiri li amri wa halul iddata min lisani yafqahu qawli. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh again. Um, I would like to... I would like to start from the issue of the escalating um, uh, nature of this uh, heinous crime that we are witnessing today in our societies. My fellow discussants have mentioned a lot, which I am going to add some few little um, instances um, to, this, to what they have mentioned. Now, when we look at, uh, when Hajia Fatima said that there is um, kind of a lack of adhering to Islamic regulations regarding um, uh, moral conditions in our society. Well, she is right. When you look at our societies today, and when you compare to it as to regard what it used to be before, you will see that there is this urge for our uh, um, young generation, and, and now some of them have become like us, and those who are a bit old, we cannot call ourselves your generation. So you can see that there is an urge from these people to copy from other societies, the free licentious sex and intermingling of sexes that is happening and that has become the way of life of these other um, societies. And those, you know that that is not what Islam has taught us. Islam has taught us beautifully how to protect our uh, um, uh, our chastity and how a woman should behave, how a man should behave in the society. But then due to the fact that a lot of us go abroad and we see what is happening and even before going abroad, right from the time when we were children, we have already traveled abroad in the television. Then now we have the social media, we have satellite, all these things expose us to different ways of life, which some of us feel that it is better than what Islam has given to them. And therefore, knowingly or unknowingly anyway, and therefore they prefer that ways or those ways of life than what we are having. And thus this free mingling and the, 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 the free sex that is taking place in other countries and the rest give rise to this upsurge in uh, social violence and rape among uh, in our society bearing the fact that our society, we still have our own cultures that are a bit different from these other cultures that have free, uh, um, free sex and the rest. And then when we look at our culture before also, I would still like to talk about our culture. When you look at our culture, when you look at our communities and our family settings before, you see that we usually have large family houses 
whereby you have either family houses or even some other houses that are not family houses, but you have different sets of people living together, um, different families either living in a single room and others in other rooms and then or room and palo and others in room and palo, but in the same compound or um, brothers living with their families in, room, uh, in the same compound. You will see that hitherto, when we were children, what we used to know is that men don't come into the house during the daytime until in the evening. They usually go out very early in the morning and they come back in the evening. Why? Because during the daytime, all the women in the house with their children, they usually engage in different activities, washing, cooking, washing the children, cleaning the house and the rest. And they do this in their own um, free attires without necessarily covering themselves. Everybody is in the compound doing his own work and chatting and whatever freely so they don't have to cover themselves and the rest. But nowadays you will see that due to the, uh, this other different cultures that we are imbibing and due to the fact that everybody feels that no, he, can, he, he has his own freedom to come into his house. A lot of men will come into the house in the midst, in the middle of the day and thus they will find these other women dressed anyhow half naked. And from there you will see that Satan is always there to whisper in our minds and these things will continue to happen whether we like it or not. Whether a man likes a woman or he doesn't like a woman, whenever he continues looking at her continuously, it's registered in his mind and something definitely will go wrong with that kind of setting. Um, then let's not forget the issue of uh, drug abuse. It's also one of the issues that escalated these things that we are witnessing today. When we talk about drug abuse, either in terms of taking of alcohol or in terms of taking, either to before, we don't have these things much in our societies. So what we are saying is that it's not like um, rape or social, sexual violence is not taking place in our societies before, but what we are saying is there is escalation of these activities now much more than before. Um, now, just as other people have said, we know that Islam is an ideal society. Uh, it gives us an ideal society. And then when you look at the, 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 the reality on ground, you will see that the Muslims have a bit deviated from our practices. Not all the Muslims, when I'm talking, not all the Muslims, but a lot of the Muslims, their practices has, have deviated from the ideal in the society. And ideally, Islamic society is a morally upright society with high degree of moral chastity. This is because Islam has put in place mechanisms, different mechanisms to ensure and to checkmate every evil tendencies in our societies. And that, uh, and therefore there are penalties that we are giving for breakage of law and order in our societies. Now, let me start talking about some of these mechanisms that Islam has put in place to checkmate this kind of evil tendencies in our societies. For example, Islam teaches us about hijab. And when we look at the issue of hijab, it can mean the hijab of the eye or the hijab of the body. Now, in the Quran, Islam, uh, Allah SWT has commanded both the men and the women, not only the women as most other people, especially the non-Muslims, are thinking that it is only the men and the women that Islam is focusing on. Islam has commanded both the men and the women to lower their gaze and protect their private parts. Now in the Quran, in Surah An-Nur, um, verse 30, Allah SWT is saying, A'u billahi minash shaitan rajim, kullil mu'minina yabudduna min afsarihim wa yahfazu furujahum dhalika azka lahum inna Allah khabirun bima yasna'un. What this means is that tell the believing men to lower their gaze from looking at um, forbidden things and protect their private parts from illegal sexual acts, etc. This is purer for them. Verily, Allah is all aware of what they do. Therefore, you can see that the Quran has stated it clearly that the men, whenever they are going outside the house or even in the house, they should lower their gaze 
foam across the opposite, opposite sex. Something will not register in your mind when you continue looking at the um, opposite sex. Now, and then the Quran also asks them to protect their private parts, not to, 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 to leave it like that, uh, going about everywhere, attacking women simply because you have something in front of you to attack women with. So also, the Quran also address the woman in the next verse, whereby it says, now, when you look at this verse, you know, it, it says that and tell the believing women to lower their gaze from looking at forbidden things and protect their private parts from illegal sexual acts and not to show off their adornment except only that which is apparent and to draw their veils over their body. So this is now an, um, an increase upon the regulations of the man. The woman is also asked to lower her gaze whenever she is abroad or inside her house, when there is a foreign person that enters that is not her mahram, she should lower her gaze. Again, she should also pro, uh, protect her private part. Now, in addition to that also, she should cover her body because her body is considered as an adornment. Her body is considered as an adornment. Therefore, she should use a himar to cover her body to the bosom so that other people will not see her beautification and fall for her. And that will lead to all these kind of problems that we are talking about. Now, when we are talking about the body of the woman, we said that the body of the woman is a, um, is, a, is, a, is, is a, a, a beautification. We are talking about what her body and her adornment, and, and her adornment like rings, bracelets, and other things. All these are adornment. So therefore, she needs to cover it. Whenever she dressed up and then she's ready to go out, then she should cover her body. Or whenever she's inside her house and somebody comes in that is not her maharam, she should cover her body before she allows that person to see her. Apart from covering her body with a himar, we also have another piece of clothes that the Quran asks us to cover our body with. That means the jalabi. And this comes in another Quranic verse um, that is um, Surah Al Ahzab, verse 59, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, uh, and here the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing the Prophet. Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, ulli azwajika wa banatika wa nisa il mu'minina. What the uh, Quran is saying here is that, O oh, Prophet, tell thy wives and daughters and the believing women that they should cast their outer garments over their persons when abroad. That is more convenient that they should be known as such and not to be molested and Allah is of forgiving, most merciful. Now this um, verse is always telling, is also telling us again that the Muslim women, while they put the kimar that will cover up to their bosom, they should also put a long jalabi, a long gown that will cover them down to their feet. A long gown that will cover them down to their feet so that whenever anybody sees them outside, he will know that they are chaste women. They should not be molested. Now. This jalabi and the himar that we are talking about, we can see that uh, it is just a standard that has been set by Islam. Now, when we look at different countries, we'll see that they have their different way of um, adhering to that standard. But what we must um, uh, be concerned with is the fact that there are three regulations concerning these standards. These regulations include the fact that these materials that they are going to use must not be a colorful material because if it is a colorful material, the moment they are working, are working abroad, men will just continue looking at them. And then it should not show their body. Otherwise, the essence of the covering has been defeated. So it should not be transparent. Again, thirdly, it should not be fitted. You should not use a fitted veil to say that you are covering your body. It should be loose in such a way that it will not show her um, body shape. It will not show her body shape. Now, the only aspect of the body that the Prophet 
has allowed the woman to show why she's going abroad is based on this hadith of the Rasulullah whereby the prophet states, if the woman reaches puberty, no part of her body should be seen but this. And he pointed to his face and hands. So therefore, based on this, we see that the only parts of the body that the woman should show is her hands and her face, her hands from the wrist to her fingers and then her face. And then we can see that other ulamas have even expanded this to show that if she covers the hand and the face, it is even better for her. Now, just like I said, in different countries, you will find people having different types of hijab and kimar. Just like in Nigeria, you, we also find out that we don't wear long gown, but we wear our own attires that also fit into that um, uh, standards that Islam has already put for us. Therefore, it is good for the woman to dress modestly because lack of dressing modestly um, draws the attention of the opposite sex to sexually harass the woman, to sexually harass the woman. I know a lot of women are saying that it is not because of uh, lack of hijab, it is not because of indecent dressing that people, well, our Islam shows us that it is lack of dressing, uh, or rather lack of dressing is one of the serious points that leads to sexual harassment. And we have seen it because when you compare the, um, when you compare the uh, uh, statistics of sexual harassment in countries that are wearing hijab and countries that are not wearing hijab, it is not comparable. It is much higher in countries that are not wearing hijab. Now, secondly, we are also told, um, Islam also draws the attention of young men that can, um, cannot be able to, uh, that have come of age, they should marry, they should get married. Because at that point of time, they are full of energy and sexual energy for that matter. Therefore, they should get married. But in any case, if they cannot get married, then they should protect themselves. They should not go about having zina or raping women. And this is where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in another verse, still in Surah to Nur. Um, and let those who find not the financial means for marriage keep themselves chaste until Allah enriches them uh, um, of His bounty. So um, Imam Tabari here in addressing this, uh, explaining this verse, he shows that if a person doesn't have the wherewithal to get married, it is not by force that he must get married because he needs to feed his wife, he needs to do some other things. He should try and um, protect himself from performing uh, zina rather until when Allah SWT will provide uh, for him. And we know that in the Quran also, Allah SWT has warned us seriously against zina or rape. Zina leads to rape. And Allah SWT said in the Quran, zina kana fahishatan asabila. And do not approach unlawful sexual intercourse. Indeed, it is ever an immorality and is evil as a way. It's evil as a way indeed because we can see all the negative tendencies that are attached to the practices of zina and then it leads to rape because anytime the person we could not get a person that um, the, a partner that he can perform zina with then you know, the, the next thing is to, uh, uh, to, 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 to to extend to uh, raping some other women so these things are highly um, abhorred by Islam then we also talk about the issue of drug Islam has also um, no, no, they're giving us regulations concerning the intake of drugs. We know that whenever a person takes drug, he gets out of his senses and he performs whatever. Sometimes they kill, they maim, all sorts of evil acts that we are facing in our in some of our uh, states nowadays. We, we cannot uh, divorce it from the influence of uh, drug. And therefore, Allah SWT said regarding uh, drugs, and he said in the Holy Quran, now, what it means is, all ye who believe intoxicants, all kinds of alcohol drinks, all kinds of intoxicants, gambling, al ansab, and al aslam, arrows for seeking love or decisions, are an abomination of shaitan's handwork. So, avoid strictly all that abominations in order that you may be successful. 
in other, uh, um, in other uh, translation, it states in other that you may prosper. So we can see intoxicants in whatever form it is, either alcohol, drugs, substance, or whatever, anything that you will take that will intoxicate you is haram in Islam because of its effects. Because when a person takes it, he performs so many bad things that are negative in Islam, that have evil tendencies. And for our societies to prosper, we must guard against taking alcohol and camera, anything that intoxicates. We must guard against taking anything that intoxicates. Because like I said, whenever a person is under the influence of intoxicants, he performs all the evil acts that one can think of in this world. Now, overall factor that we are going to look at, we will see that in all what we have been discussing, shaitan is one major factor that keeps on appearing in all what we have been discussing. And therefore, Allah SWT has also warned us strictly against shaitan. He warned us in the Quran. Still, we are in Surah to nur verse 21. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Ya ayu alladhina amunu la tattabi'u khutuwati shaytan. Wa man yattabi'u khutuwati shaytan, fa innahu ya'muru bil fahashai wal munkar. For you who believe, follow not the footsteps of shaytan. And whosoever follows the footsteps of shaytan, then verily he commands al fahsha. That means to commit indecency, illegal sexual and intercourse, etc. And al munkar, disbelief and polytheism. That means to do evil and wicked deeds, to speak or to do what is forbidden in Islam. So therefore the Quran has made it clear. The Quran has made it clear for us that we should avoid following the footsteps of shaitan because he is an avowed enemy to us. And he is the one that will make us perform al-fasha, al-munkar and all other things. Now this will lead us to the issue of um, evil whispering. That is our second question. We have, already, we have just spoken about the effect of Satan. The Prophet Sallallahu said, there is no one among you but a companion from among the jinn has been assigned to him. What it means here is that every one of us has a jinn assigned to us. And this jinn is a Satan, known as Karim. That is a companion. That is your companion, my companion, and everybody has this companion assigned to him. And what is the main objective of this companion? Just to take you off the straight path of Allah by constantly whispering at you in the bit that you will take the bait. And whenever you take to his whispering, then you are destroyed. So therefore, how do we defeat these whisperings of our Karim that are always around us, that are always with us? We have some few steps, and then there are more, of course, but I will mention some few steps here that will help us to uh, guard against these whisperings. Now, number one, a person should be insistent upon reciting um, a Quran every day, and a person should be consistent with it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, ordered us to recite the Quran always because it protects us against all these whisperings of the shaitan. Now, um, it has been reported also that Is bin al-Hajjaj said, the shaitan said to me, that means said to him, I came to you like a camel, which is fat and ready to be slaughtered. And now I am like a sparrow. So al just said to him, how is, the, uh, how is that? And then Satan replied to him, you have weakened me with the book of Allah. That means recitation of Allah, of the Quran. So we can see how important recitation of the Quran is in keeping, checkmating the evil whisperings of Satan. Also, number two is constant remembrance of Allah. At all times, whatever we are going to do, Wherever we are, we should keep on remind, uh, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly, and that will protect us from uh, 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 going heat and following the whisperings of shaitan. Ibn al Qayyim, as Zawji said, the remembrance of Allah represses the shaitan 
it puts him in distress and afflicts injuries upon him, like the injuries whips afflict when used. This is why the shaitan of the believers uh, becomes weak and frail. This is because every time the shaitan interferes with him, the believer releases, um, releases upon him his whips of remembrance, of turning towards Allah, of seeking forgiveness and obedience. Thus, his shaitan will be in a severe state of punishment. On the other hand, the shaitan of the evil doer gets a lot of stronger and arrogant and arrogance due to him being in a state of leisure and gentleness. So whoever does, uh, doesn't punish their shaitan in this world with his remembrance of Allah, his monotheism, his seeking forgiveness, and his obedience towards Allah, then they will be punished by their shaitan with the blazing fire in the hereafter. They will be punished by Allah together. So there is no escape from whether you punish your shaitan or you allow your shaitan to get you punished together with him. Now, thirdly, when we are talking about um, whispering of the shaitan, another means of checkmating this whispering of the shaitan is by seeking refuge with Allah, always asking Allah to help you to empower, uh, to, 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 to overpower your uh, shaitan. And um, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, um, and if an evil whisper comes to you from shaitan, then seek refuge um, with Allah. Verily, he is uh, the all hearer and all knower. So this is Surah Al-Araf. And therefore, whenever you feel like you are having these whispers in your mind, shaitan is asking you to do something, seek refuge from Allah. Seek refuge from Allah. We have been advised there are so many du'as that one can do in order to seek refuge. And then at so many given times when you are entering here or you are doing these things, there are du'as that Islam provides for us that we will um, recite that will protect us uh, from Satan. For example, when you recite um, La ilaha illallah wa hadawu la sharika lahu lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamdu wa ala kulli shayin kadir, 10 times or 100 times a day, then that will protect you from shaitan for the entire day. Other du'as, for example, uh, when you are entering the washroom, you can uh, uh, um, recite Allahumma inya udbika min al wal kabais. When one is angry, you can say A'udhu billahi min al-shaitan rajim. When um, stopping in a place, you can say A'udhu bi kalimati Allahi tamma min shawri ma khalaka. When starting to read the Quran, one can say A'udhu billahi sami al-alim min al-shaitan rajim. So there are a lot of these um, um, du'as that Allah SWT has taught us, and then the Prophet SAW has also taught us so that one can protect himself from the whispers of the shaitan at every given time he is in his life. The next one is do not take the bait. Yes, do not take the bait. When you feel like um, shaitan is whispering to you to go and do something, especially when that thing is an evil thing, do not take the bait. Ignore his whisperings. Do not go ahead and perform those evil things. And sometimes you find yourself either doing recitation of the Quran, for example, or you are praying or doing something that is halal. And then you will find that the Satan will be whispering to you some other halal things for you to go and do. What it means is just that for you to leave, for example, the recitation of the Quran you are doing and to go and do some other good things. But what you don't know is that from the time you leave the recitation of the Quran to the time that you are going to do other things, Satan will further whisper to you so that at the end of the day, you lose both the two. You lose the recitation of the Quran and you lose the other thing that you are in a haste to go and do. So therefore, simply don't take the bait. Ignore whatever evil tendencies that you hear from your brain. Or when you are doing good things, continue with your good things. Don't think about other good things. Now, Finally, rectify and strengthen your belief in the oneness of Allah through your sincere obedience and worship to him. Now, whatever you are going to do, especially in your acts of ibadat, be sincere in your acts of ibadat, be sincere in your acts of worship. That will protect you against the evil whispers of shaitan. A certain person asks, Hassan al-Basri, does Iblis sleep? 
And Hassan al-Basri smiled and responded, if he slept, he would have found rest. So what this shows us is that forever in your life, you will be living with that yokarim. That means the shaitan that is beside you that will always be whispering to you. So the point we are trying to make here is that whether you defeat this yokarim or he defeats you, struggle continues. Even when he defeats you, he will continue to defeat you until you take your last breath. Because he knows that there is possibility that if he leaves you, you might bounce back to righteousness. Therefore, he will continue to defeat you and ensure that you remain defeated until you take your last breath, until you go back to Allah. Therefore, always take care of your devotions. Don't ignore your devotions and be sincere whenever you are performing your devotional acts. Allah SWT has already told us in the Quran what Satan has promised. And Allah SWT said in still Surah Al-Ahraf, where Satan has promised that he is going to stand in our, light, in, in our right, in our left, in our front, in our back, and continue to whisper to us continue to take us away from the way of Allah. And he swear that he will take almost many of us with the exception of the few that Allah will save. So that is how bad it is. A person should ensure that he's practicing these things so that he protects himself from the whispers of shaitan. And then also the Prophet Sallallahu also teaches us that we should also pray for some others, not only for ourselves. The Prophet Sallallahu constantly used to pray for everybody and he used to pray for his sons, Al-Hassan and uh, Al-Hussein, against the um, evil tendencies of shaitan, against any poisonous pest, against any other uh, evil, every other evil, harmful, envious eyes and the rest. So we should always ensure that we engage in praying for our children, our husbands, and the entire Muslim Ummah against these evil tendencies of Satan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Hadja Saluti, for your uh, contributions from the perspective of faith. We actually have a lot of uh, uh, hands raised, a few hands raised. Um, but what we'll do is we'll take questions at the end. So if you have a question, please just type it in. We already have a few that are waiting, so I will take that at the end. So um, I'll take it to Hajia Fatima now to give us the final remarks from the perspective of an educator. Hajia Fatima, you have a school and uh, you are responsible for the education of young boys and girls every single day. Um, what can you say are practical ways that parents can uh, contributes to educating their young boys and girls on um, sexual violence, on rape, on consent. Uh, how can we protect our young boys and girls? What, what, how, how can parents practically, because there's a stigma around the topic of being harassed and being touched and, and all of these things that you want to protect your kids from, but it's a real problem. A lot of people, their first exposure to uh, harassment was at an extremely young age before they could even process what it is. So from your understanding, um, uh, what are the ways that parents can um, educate and protect their children from predators and rapists and abusers? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, before I answer that, actually, um, I'd like to, I think you, you made a point, you made a reference um, at the beginning before, um, the speaker, the speaker that just finished said something. And uh, you said it's not only in, it doesn't only happen in Muslim societies. Yes, very true. Because yesterday I was in another discussion with um, with some other lady and, and another group, and they were talking about how it happens in the churches. So it's also happening there, you know? And one thing we were able to understand from that discussion is that, you know, Shaitan loves as, um, isolation, pornography, or people engaged in pornographic acts, they love isolation. So what you need to do is stay away, create space and stay away from those people. 
never go into their private space, never allow them to call you to do something for them privately or to be in that um, space. So I just wanted to add that, you know, so it happens all across, it's all over the world in every, almost every country of the world, if I may say that, and in, it happens across all faiths. So the way I see it is even, even though I am, yes, I am, my, my occupation is um, education, running a school, I see this as a, we need to approach it holistically. Very, very important. So as they say, it takes a village to raise a child. So unless we work together, you know, and, and come up with this and begin to put things in place uh, to stop that cycle. Because honestly, um, I don't want to say it's too late. I don't want to sound like, you know, I'm being negative, you know, but looking on the positive side to say, look, we can get these children young. We can catch them young. Um, it doesn't have, the cycle doesn't have to continue again. So, uh, so bottom line, you know, there's an, you know, urgent need for major social reforms on all levels and complete overhaul of some of our existing systems. So if, uh, you know, if the social ills and vices uh, of the social ills and, and vices bedeviling our societies and, um, you know, so, so we need to effectively address this problem. And what we need to do is put the best place, uh, the best plan in place and rely on Allah. So starts with good leadership, then followers. We need good leadership in this. We need, um, especially I'm calling out to our men to spearhead this reform. So first, leadership. Then second, we need to work on our intentions as a team. You know, what are our intentions? What can every one of us do? because it involves every one of us. We live in this society, it is our community. So what can we all do? Um, you, me, men, women, you know, elders, ulama, the government, every individual, you know, to fight this facade uh, for Allah's sake. Uh, the balance of tawakkul and efforts uh, are actions of the, of the prophets and people of knowledge. So we need to find that balance. Then we need to have unity of purpose you know, reestablish trust. So we need to recognize that this is a huge societal ill, a huge societal problem. Uh, so therefore we need to, like I said earlier, unite a common front and, and have a concerted effort to fight this. So um, again, I'm going to call our men and the government to lead the way. Uh, Allah has already said, you are a rijal kawamun ala nisa. So swing into action. That is your job to protect us, to protect the society, to watch over us you know, to, 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 to guard us. And, and so this is your job, you know, so we need you to swing into action. Allah has already said, he does not like those who spread facade, you know, so we must stop it. We must find a way to stop it. Else we risk, you know, uh, earning the anger of Allah, which we don't want. So the punishment has been clearly stated in the Quran. In Surah al -Ma so we need to begin to enforce those things. Then as an ummah, as an ummah, um, uh, my, the, the speaker, you know, that just finished speaking, has already mentioned, has said a lot about things we need to do. But as an ummah, you know, we need to return to the Quran and Sunnah. Very, very important. We have wronged Allah, and so we need to do plenty istighfar as a community. Plenty istighfar. And this is a clarion call to everybody. You know, sins do not go away until we repent and ask for forgiveness from our Creator, honestly. So, we need to encourage also the recitation of the Quran, as the speaker has already said. Then I'm also asking the ulama to adjust their sermons, you know, and, and, and see how we can adjust and then begin to communicate with the ummah, you know. So a deliberate effort by them, by the ulama, on ilm, the knowledge, on amal, the action, and then adab, character building. These are very important in education. And the root of Islam reformation is the fear of Allah. So we need to find a way to bring the ummah back on track and reconnect them with Allah and get them to be very conscious of Allah. Um, and so we need to find a way of getting the ummah to move into action. Islam is a way of life. It is a way of life. So we have to find a way of bringing that way of life, you know? So, um, and also what, the one thing that is very important is the nafs is weak. So tazkiyat and nafs, plenty of that. Tazkiyat and nafs, purification of the soul. Then we need to embark on an aggressive sensitization, awareness campaign, advocacy, you know? So advocacy is in public schools, rural communities. This is where I'm afraid the most. You know, we think we're in our homes, 
in the urban communities, our ch- we keep our children safe, but who is taking care of the ones in the rural communities, in the villages? Who is taking care of them? I'm so afraid of this, honestly. A few days ago, I went to a building site and when I got there, uh, there's this, there was this, there's this pool of water um, that the builders use. And in that um, water, it's not deep, you know, it's just like a pool. And, and there was a lot of algae in it and a lot of dead things in it. And the, I saw this girl, 13 year old girl and a 10 year old boy bathing in that water, bathing in that water, building site with men there. So I, I asked her and she was naked. She was naked. And I asked her, I said, what are you doing here? And she said, her mom sent her to Hawk to sell food to a building site. And she came from like, you know, the, the neighborhood where she came from was very far from where that place was. So I said to her, where are your shoes? She said in the building, in the other building site. Okay. So she couldn't come out because she was naked. So I had to cover her. She came out of the pool and then she put her clothes on and then she went home. Of course, her brother scurried. He ran away, we couldn't see him. Then later, she came back again. What are you doing back here? She said she forgot her hijab, subhanAllah, her hijab. So I asked her, where is your hijab? She said, it's upstairs in that same building site. So I said, okay, come, let's go and get it. So I went upstairs there. And in the corner, there's a mattress with net and her hijab was there. So I was just left to my imagination, honestly. I, it just, I was so depressed that day. I felt bad. So I came back home thinking our own children are safe in our homes. Who is taking care of this girl? You know? So it's really, uh, there's a lot, you know? So aggressive sensitization, awareness campaign, advocacy, very, very important. In those communities, their parents need to know, you know? And then government partnering with communities, NGOs. There's so many NGOs doing very good work out there. They've been doing it for a long time. As um, Hajia has said as well, she's also doing work in that area. So government needs to partner with these organizations, empower neighborhood, neighborhood watch. I know for a fact that my community, my school community, um, where, where they live, they've contacted me to say, look, Hajia, we want to start working on this. And they're men. I was so happy to hear that they were men standing up and they want to do the work and they need support. So empower the neighborhood, you know, neighborhood watch to begin to watch over their own, over our own, you know. Um, you know, so, but it's important that they partner with government because you don't want overzealousness, you know, or, or people taking laws into their hands, you know. Um, then children's education, children's education. Now we must empower our children. Um, we must sensitize them and we must teach them. We have to begin to catch them young so that we start to reverse this trend. Now, if you remember, I mentioned, I said, look, uh, these perpetrators, I am sure they started right when they were young. They, had, they were exposed to something and now they've grown and they're so old into it that you know it, nothing can be done. They're just doing it. You know? So we need to catch these ones young and stop them in their tracks. So empower children, teach children how to speak up, you know? teach them and give them the language too because children really don't have the vocabulary to communicate what is happening to them. They don't. So we need to begin to, uh, to, to work together to teach children how to empower them with vocabulary, uh, how to express their emotions, their feelings. Uh, and then when they're not able, because when they're not able to voice um, um, their emotions, okay, they swallow it in and then it becomes uh, in a voice of blame. They begin to blame themselves that they're bad people when things like this happen to them. And then we also need to teach them that their bodies are an amana for them. It belongs to them, the forces of their body. Nobody is in charge of it, you know? And then teach them also self-defense, bad touch. What does bad touch mean? Have those conversations with them. Build that trust with them. Because what you want is them coming to you to tell you something has happened. So talking is what brings them. Then teach them their askar protection, how to protect themselves. Because when they have askar, you know, when, they, when they, they're used to their daily askar, inshallah, they're protected. And then also we need to sensitize them about the potential environmental threats. So about the dangers of watching pornography, because kids, the first age at which kids are exposed to pornography is the age of 10, is the age of 10. And the sickening thing is almost all our children have been exposed to it at some point in time because it's on social media, it's all over, you know? So, so we need to teach them, you know, the dangers of it, uh, of inappropriate content. And then we also need to teach them that, look, no keeping of secrets. Nobody should tell you 
that you keep secrets. Nobody. There's no such thing as secrets. Your parents are there for you. And in school, your school head is there and some, 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 and, and your teachers. So speak to them, talk to them. Nobody should tell you keep. Then we also need to tell them about boundaries, about personal space. You know, children should stop jumping on uncles and, and male teachers and, and, and neighbors, you know, and hugging them and kissing them. Parents, please, no, you shouldn't allow this. We need to teach children to stay away, okay? Then about being in charge of their bodies, like I said, uh, then we also need to teach them about privacy times. The Quran has spelt it clearly. Now, you, if you remember in the, at the beginning, I said, let's go back to the Quran and say that there's a lot in there that we need to begin to teach our children. So it's not just about memorizing Quran. Islam is a way of life. We need to begin to teach children from that angle, you know, about how to live Islam. And there are provisions in there for them. There are privacy times, times that you're not allowed to go in to your mother's room or to your sister's room as a male, even if you're a maharam, you know? So it's the time before Subh, the time between Zuhur and Asr, and the time after Isha. Those are privacy times. So things like that, you know? And, and we also need to teach them about their private parts. Give them, you know, they, knew, they need to know where their private areas are. Then teach them religion and ethics, you know, conduct. Teach the commandment of Allah about haya, about hijab. She has already mentioned it. Commandment that, you know, hijab is your commandment from Allah. It's not about you being pretty or anything. No, it's about Allah giving you that commandment. He created us. He knows the dangers. So we need to teach our children about this, about lowering of the gaze. Teach the boys their responsibility as gawam. Now, children from a young age need to, you know, what we do is the mistake we make is we treat boys as kings and then girls as their servants. So you see that the girls are the ones washing up, cleaning, and the boys are sitting there. All they do is just play. So all sexes are equal before Allah, except that the man has been put a degree above the woman. Why? Because of his physique, his strength, and so he, he, he's our guardian, he's our protector, you know, and then because of providing for her, he goes out to look for food to come and provide for his family. He has been put in charge of his family, so he's in charge. So we need to begin to teach our boys that. And then um, teach them also enjoining good and forbidding evil. Teach the children that it's time for everything, that it's step for everything. Because what you find is once they're approaching puberty, you know, they begin to feel sensations in their body. So they cannot even understand it. And then all it takes is for them to mix with the wrong crowd, bad friends. And then they begin to want to practice, you know, and exercise those feelings that they're, you know, experiencing. So there's a time for everything, you know. So and then we also need to let them know that it is the parents' job or the school's job to protect them you know, and then educate them about their rights from a young age, their rights as children, good parenting, a good name, a right to good education, a right to quality time with your parents, a right to being role, you know, your parents being role models for you because the parents are the first school. And then marry them when they, they've reached the age of marry, marriage, marry them to good men and good women. Very, very important. And educate them about relationships with opposite sex their body parts, the private parts, and so on and so forth. How to mix, how to mingle. Islam has already provided that. Then as a school, we need to put protective measures in place, policies in place to protect the students as well as the teachers. Now I say teachers because sometimes children lie as well for attention seeking. So those measures are to protect everybody and then help them create safe persons. Now this is very, very important. When you're teaching them about bad touch, when somebody touches you in areas that are private to you, you need to run to somebody and tell them. And that person is called a safe person. So create a network of safe people for them, like two, three to five people. And that team, that group should include um, parents and school. Now, because sometimes it's the parents, the fathers are the perpetrators. So if a father is molest molesting a child, the child should be able to come to the school teacher or the school head and tell them. And vice versa, sometimes it's the school teachers that do it. So if that is happening in school, the child should be able to go to the parent. So that's why you have a mix of that team. And then, um, um, you know, older kids about mingling with the op opposite sex. So sometimes, sometimes their older siblings are watching pornographic 
material. So we need to teach them about that as well. And then teach them about puberty, changing body sensations, the feelings they're experiencing, what it means according to the Quran and Sunnah. And then also pornography. Um, then relationship and conduct between them and teachers. Because sometimes teachers are standing and you just see children run up and jump on the teachers or hold their hands. So we have been trying to separate that. Stay away. Very important. And then the concept of our education. Now I spoke about education earlier must change. So schools must begin to bring in, you know, aside from the knowledge, adapt, teach character education, teach manners, and then also practicing, practicing in Islam. Mm. The purpose of education is learning about the creator, worship him. And then excellence must be measured in terms of character of the children, relationship with others, level of God consciousness. Remember I said we need to catch them young. So now begin to train our children to tell them what is most important. Their, their character is most important, not chasing money. Very, very important. And then our curriculum also must be integrated uh, so that students are able to make meaningful connections, you know, connections between Allah, between Allah's creation, because all knowledge is from Allah, so they need to understand that. Then about societal engagement, understanding the differences in society, understanding that we are brother's keepers, the culture of respect, boys respecting women, honoring women. The culture of inclusion, acceptance, tolerance, harmony, peace, you know, and that. Then the approach to teaching must also be role modeled after the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, um, you know and, and, and stuff like that. So th that is our role model. The, he is our example. So that is who we need to follow. I want the girls to learn that they have power to shape the world, to nurture the, the world, you know, nurture, nurture the world with their endowed qualities. To understand man is a degree above her, so he's her leader, not her boss. The difference being one builds her and the other clips her wings. It doesn't, uh, you know, I, I don't want the girls to look elsewhere for support, but to the dean, to real men. Because what is happening today in our society is feminism is eating up our girls because of the injustice in society. So we have allowed that gap and something else is coming to teach them what it means, you know, to be a woman. But already Allah has given you that honor. Why do you want to look up to something else? Okay. And then, of course, parenting 101. Parents have lost it. And we need to come back to the drawing board to begin to teach them how to parent again in terms of their attitude and their competence to take care of children. The legal system needs to wake up, you know, to their responsibilities. Because for such crime, stringent and quick punishment is essential. Otherwise, there is no deterrent. So clearly laid out provisions in the Quran for those who commit such heinous crimes. It's there, killing, crucifixion, cutting of the limbs on opposite sides, ostracization, imprisonment, it is there. Please wake up to your responsibilities and begin to um, put it in place. So um, I'll stop there and then we'll go into questions again. Thank you so, we so have much. To Thank you for your contributions. May Allah make it easy for all of us that are on the path of... Uh, mm working on this um, very serious uh, matter in our society. And um, only through collective effort can we actually progress. I think there needs to be, um, there's a very uh, big gap between those that are at the higher, those that are much older and the youth as well and are not only uh, making, not only making impact uh, in society in regard to sexual violence, but also, um, in terms of understanding preventative measures, there's a very big gap uh, and we need to meet in the middle so that the dialogue can be very clear and we can speak in the language of today as well because um, you know, it's one thing to, to uh, uh, not everybody would listen even if you speak to them in a way that they should be spoken to. So sometimes you have to speak in a person's language and a lot of there are, are also issues that affect our grassroots communities. So these are people that are not ed as educated as we are, and they're not privileged and they're not exposed. Um, the, the, uh, and we continue to see a rise in these cases. So may Allah make it easy for us. Uh, so I'll move on to questions now. Uh, we'll run through them very quickly uh, because we're racing against time. Uh, we have we have a, a, a bunch of questions, but then the first four are the same, actually, just asked differently. 
Um, it's touching on um, what uh, Haji has added to actually talked about, but it is more, I think, I think I would, I would pass it on to Kaya to answer. So generally what the questions are asking is, uh, if we're talking about a, a lack of modesty being the reason for some rape cases, then how can we explain the rape of infants and even babies? So I think this is more of a psychological issue than it is a conscious and uh, all I want to, you know, I, I feel like predators are not, they don't function in that way. These are people that are barbaric by nature. These are people that have animalistic tendencies. And for you to abuse and rape a child uh, makes you one of the most, I think, uh, problematic uh, people within our society. And to know that these are people that are also present in our homes and within our families is just a, a very scary. So, um, Rukaya, I'll ask you from a psychological perspective, uh, if modesty isn't an explanation, then what is? Because when we're talking about infants, infants don't need to cover, right? Yeah, um, honestly, um, when she was speaking, I appreciate that she was trying to speak on the preventive measures, but I think um, all of us, as we are growing up, or majority of the audiences here, we've heard about how to prevent ourselves from being harmed, from being raped since when we're in kindergarten. I think as a woman, that is one of the first instincts that your parents try to start teaching you. I think um, to some large extent, like we've been talking about preventives. Can we move on to how to teach the boys the prevention of not, of not having ownership of objective, objecting women to objects and doing whatever they want to do and go scot-free? And what does Islam say about that? I was expecting prof, prof to talk about that because that is most important than being prevent than saying the preventives that we've heard over and over again. And then um, she discussed about um, how men, um, if they see women constantly, she then will whisper and then that will be rape. I mean, how would you explain about raping three year old? You know, like a um, three-year-old, three-months-old baby in a pampers. She was wearing her pampers when she got raped. How would you explain that? Was she, was she supposed to wear the hijab? There are these things in our society because we don't speak about the implication Islamically, and that I know we don't speak about the consequences Islamically. All we keep saying is what and what the woman should keep doing. We've been doing it, we've been doing it, we've been, we've been raped. She was talking about reading of the Quran. Lots of Imams raped these girls. Islamic school is a center of being raped and, and um, being sexually assaulted. Is like the primary source of assault, assaultation of sexually Islamia. That is where you go to learn the deen. And it's still back to not teaching the men preventives and what they are not entitled to. And um, what I'm trying to say is, yes, sometimes it's a psychological problem, but most times I don't believe it's a psychological problem. Men do what they want to do because they know there are no consequences in the society. Build up, uh, empower our legal system. Let it be free and fair. Let the justice take its course and see how rape will reduce drastically. Things happen because there are no consequences and because people keep blaming the victims. They keep stigmatizing the victims, keep blaming the victim. What are you wearing? How can you tell me what a three month baby was wearing? The case we had of the Rukaya baby like a month ago, it's, it's the most devastating thing I have seen. What was she wearing, her pampers? What could she have worn? I think okay. the conversation and the spaces should move from preventives and more telling about consequences and implications, both in our society and Islamically. What are the consequences of a rapist? If he rapes, what did Allah, what has Allah ordained us to do to him? 
and how would society, how would the society treat that rapist? I think okay. we should be moving. Um, I think I also, I also want to add that there, there's been a, a emphasis on uh, the safety of women and the girl child uh, throughout this discussion without factoring that uh, young boys are also um, targets of a lot of uh, rape cases, um, yeah. especially in um, a lot of um, these schools, uh, religious centers, places that you would expect these people would go to to be safe or to be educated. And maybe those that are in charge of them tend to uh, take advantage of them, sometimes even in families. So it's important to acknowledge that it's not just a problem that exists as a threat to the safety of women and uh, the girl child, but also to young boys, uh, which I'm glad Dr. Fatima actually touched on that in regards to um, uh, educating uh, students and uh, the parents' uh, contributions as well. Um, so let's uh, move on. So the second question is, how will you... Okay, so as, um, uh, sorry, Hadja, I, think, I want to say something. Yes. I think there is I, a lot of attack on what I have said, so I think I should be given a chance to... Sure. Yes. Yes. Um, now, we are in a program. We are discussing an issue, okay? All of us, what we said, are contributing factors to what is happening in the society. Therefore, whenever one of us is trying to speak, he's trying to add on to what other people have said, not diminishing the importance of what others have said. It is the conglomeration of what all of us have said that is giving way, that is causing what is happening in our societies. Therefore, what um, Madam Ria have said, what Madam Fatima has said, and what I have said, I did put it together. But at the same time, I tried not to repeat what some of these people have said. I've, Known a lot of these things that they have said, but I tried not to repeat it. Therefore, I tried to bring some other dimensions of what is happening in our society. Now, when we say that indecent dressing is causing these things, there is no any contradiction that indecent dressing is also causing these things. Let's know that what is happening in a society, when one tree is bad, it will go on to affect all other trees. The fact that a person raped a th three months old girl, that does not mean that it is not the um, nudities that he is seen outside that is, has caused him to come and rape, it, uh, it, it, it has no effect on him as he has raped a three year old, um, three months old girl, no. Of course, when he sees that nudity outside and he has no, he, did, he, he didn't get anybody to rape, of course, he will come and rape the, 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 the three-year-old girl. And let's not forget that I have also spoken about the whispers of the shaitan. I have given you verses of the Quran that Allah has told us that Quran, the shaitan is an avowed enemy to us. Shaitan is an avowed enemy to us. And we have given also a Quran verse that shows us that all this immorality and other acts, evil acts that we are performing are pushed by the, 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 the we are pushed by the Satan to perform them. So I, I, I don't think I have, um, I have relegated any other factor uh, and then the, 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 the less than any other factor that we are discussing here. And of course, good moral upbringing is another factor. We must go back and teach ourselves good moral upbringing. And we, we have a lot of that in the Quran. The Quran has shown us, just like others have said, it respects the woman and it is the best religion in the world that has respect the woman, Islam. And through the Quran, we have been given a lot of uh, uh, um, ways that men can respect the woman, including they should not rape her, they should not perform zina with her. Not only the woman, but generally, what the men and the women, they were given regulations concerning all these things. The Quran in Surah, um, uh, um, Surah Al-Nur has taught us, 
azaniya to azani fajridu kull wahid wahid min huma mi'at jalada that means anybody that performs zina and then including rape of course whenever we are talking about zina let's not forget that well, the, the punishment is the same with rape this is the punishment that she should be given so let's not think that what i am saying i'm just saying it as they are the only um penalties or they are the only ways that um, the causes of um, rape in our society and they are the only ways that we can cope. No, it is in addition to what other people have said. Thank you, Salaamu Alaikum. Okay, Salaamu Alaikum, may I say something? Yes, please, Dr. Fatima. Yes, <laughs> Dr. Fatima, my name is Fatima. Sorry, <laughs> Fatima. I'll give you a designation. <laughs> Sorry, Haji Fatima, please. <laughs> okay, I, I really worried about, um, so what they're saying is, if we say wear the hijab properly, you know, preventive measures in terms of that, you know, so how do you explain women in their homes, in their rooms? Because one of the stories that the men told me, you know, the, the community thing I was telling you about, was that when the husbands go out to work, and uh, sorry, to the mosque early in the morning, there was a man that kept coming into their homes to rape their wives. And so that day he was caught by a woman. She was very strong and she held on to him. You know, so how do you explain a small child, two month old baby, one month old baby, two year old child, how do you explain that? Now, if you remember, I mentioned pornography. I don't have any proof of this, but I'm sure there have studies that have been carried out. But wallahi, let me tell you, pornography is a disease, is a plague. This thing has been happening for a long time. It knows no imam, no pastor, no adult, no child. Everybody is into pornography. Everybody is watching it. Now, what happens is it's like drug addiction. The minute you begin to watch it, okay, it creates pathways in your brain. It opens it up in such a way as it reminds you to crave for more. So when you watch it once, you want to watch it more and more and more again. So there will be a time when it gets to a time when it's, it, it potency just wears off. So it's not enough. Then you begin to venture into the more bizarre things. So you want to do stuff. So when you see it, you want to carry it out on somebody. Now, they have wives. Sometimes they're not married. Sometimes they're married. So their wives will not be enough for them anymore, those that are married. And those that are not married, you know, young girls or, or, or older girls are not enough. So they begin to venture into smaller children. So this is the bizarre nature of it. it and then, of course, it's a medium for shaitan. Like I said to you, um, it likes isolation. Shaitan loves the person who is in isolation. That's where the whispering happens. And then pornography, is um, it thrives because number one, it's very cheap. It's very cheap. It's on the handset. They can see it anytime they want to see it. Then it's accessible, very easy to access. Access it is online. It's everywhere. Then it is aggressive. And then it is anonymous because they do it in hiding. They don't allow you to see it. So the minute they're charged like that, they want to carry it out on, on women. And women are stronger. So they, they now move to more bizarre stuff. They want to attack children. And this is what is happening. So children are easier prey. And that is what is happening. So it's depravity. Wallahi, it is depravity. We need to fight that pornography. It's very important. Where, where we don't, maybe we don't know about it, but this is the medium. This is really what explains uh, you moving on to smaller children, because this is what it teaches you. It's a lie. It's screen. What you see on TV is somebody, it takes like sometimes years of acting, but they come in and condense it into like two hours. So it's, it's like lies. It's just fantasy. It's just a funny thing. So what they see on TV, they want to come out and act it out. So they use children. Children are easier medium. Subhanallah. May Allah protect us from this um, evil. I mean. I hope answered uh, the question. Thank you so much, um, Hajiya Fatima. So I will uh, move on to the next question, which, which is actually um, directed at you, something that you have said. So the question is, how will you know that this person is into pornography to avoid them? Um, well, I'm not so <laughs> sure about avoiding, but to be honest with you, Almost everybody is into pornography. Almost everybody is watching it, especially boys. 70% uh, of the users of porn online are men. 
and 30% are women. That's uh, the statistic. So um, really, this is what we see because it's, like I said, she's anonymous. You don't see it coming, they hide. They don't want you to see it. And, but many times, um, sometimes when the man is married and he's into watching pornography, you find that he's off his wife because she's not enough anymore. So he wants more bizarre stuff. So sometimes it's a sign when um, a man is off his wife and, 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 and it's a sign that this is happening sometimes, but not all of the time, um, you know, and then there are other signs as well that of, of this happening. So um, this is another talk really, but pornography is just another um, subject <laughs> entirely, trust me. But this is a big problem, but lying, big problem. And many men, older men, Imams, like I said, pastors, um, brothers that we know, uncles are watching it. They're watching it and many have become addicted. It's very addictive. It really destroys your frontal lobe, your brain, just like drugs affects it. So you crave and crave and crave for more and then you want to do more bizarre things. That's why we're seeing this with children. Subhanallah. We have a, another contribution from Amina, who is one of the uh people that have tuned into our webinar she said i think one of the measures we should be taking uh is how to protect about one of the measures we should be taking is how to protect people from pornography by discussing it okay she's saying that we should one of the measures we should we should take is by discussing it in our families and educating children about it in school Absolutely, absolutely. I've been doing that. I've been doing that, inshallah. And there's so many that are learning this now. We are in a course, we're learning it. So, uh, you know, it's something that you need to educate yourselves. Parents, educate yourselves about pornography, how it happens, what it what happens, you know. And um, I don't know if some of you have watched Elephant um, in the Room, have to have hard conversations with children. I have had several conversations with my girls about online pornography, you know, and stuff like that. So, Many of them have been exposed to, this, to it. So it is better we sit down and have heart to heart, frank conversations about it. And there, there are many ways that you can, um, uh, sorry, that there's a way that you actually have to ha you can have that conversation, which I've done before. And um, maybe perhaps we can find a way of sharing it again and, and, and teaching people how. Hajia you Fatima, I think, I think as a owner of a school that was a time like last year or last two years were doing sensitizations in school and then I came across a teacher when she was telling me a story about how a little girl always comes to her and telling her that her uncle ate her cookie and then she says that like after every week yeah. she comes grumpy and auntie my uncle ate my cookie I should be like okay sorry don't give him your cookie again so at the end of the term at the end of the term, she wrote on a report, she always complains about her uncle eating her cookie. That was when the mom realizes that was their code, cookie was their code of her yes. thing. Yes, so yes. like that was an eye opener to me because I feel sometimes you don't have to be hiding the names because before it gets to you as the parent, the damage has been done. If yes. only the teacher realizes what the cookie was. So, I mean, you as a school um, um, proprietress, I think you can talk to the, there should be a meeting between the teachers and the parents on saying the code of that thing so that the teacher could understand quicker. Yes, I mentioned that and actually. Because it's very important that parents and school partner on this. Yeah. Very, yeah. Very, yeah. they work together. They communicate with each other, and so whatever the school teaches the children, you communicate to the parents, and whatever yes. the parents is teaching, you tell the teacher. Yes, because I yes. I able to intercept that because we taught them how to defend themselves, um, yeah. taught them bad touch. We we've had a girl come up to us, and we have you know sorted that this was a long time ago in school, yeah. and we were able to accept and protect her. Actually, Very so good. imagine yes. And if you do that with school children, but like I said to you, I'm just worried about those in the rural areas. The mothers yes. need eating. We need to begin to teach those people in, 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 in those areas, honestly, who is taking care of them, who is teaching them all this stuff. So we have to embark on this very aggressive awareness campaign. Like that girl I told you about, who is taking care of her? And her mother is at home. She doesn't know what she's doing. 
you know just like you said poverty of the stomach the mind and the dean yes yeah so poverty yes very yeah. important yeah assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wa alaikum assalam can i do you have further questions or can i say something we have two more questions okay i just want to elaborate more on the issue of um the mm. fact that we said quran can protect a person from performing evil acts okay now we have to understand that um the kind of quran we are talking about a lot of us read the quran but we are just reading it without even knowing its meanings and without living it surely when a person reads the quran and he is living by the dictates of the quran then definitely it will protect him definitely from performing evil acts we have seen a situation where the um, sahaba told us that whenever the prophet sallam teaches them quran they take 10 ayahs at a time and then they will study it study all its regulations and whatever it takes and put it into practice before they will come back and learn 10 more ayahs so the fact that you find an imam or a bishop or whatever a pastor or whatever practicing um uh, immorality that does not mean that they are all human beings and they are not far from the evil um, whisperings of the shaitan that just means that they are not practicing what their religion has taught them simply that is all thank you thank you so much um Hajias Adatu for that addition so uh we have we actually have three more minutes on the clock so what i'll do is I have to suspend the question and move on to just uh, listing out the uh, organizations that we said we would list out for the benefit of the audience. Um, we will also list out the organization on the uh, video that will be on the YouTube of Did You Know? So please, if you are not able to take it down now, you can uh, make reference to that. And I'm sure there's so many other organizations uh, that are out there, please, if you are interested in being a part in supporting uh, financially or in being a member to, to work on these cases, because the cases are extremely overwhelming, uh, there aren't enough people out there that are working on it sincerely. So I'll just mention a few and then we'll, we'll list them out properly on the video. So the first one is the Stand to End Rape Initiative, S-T-E-R Initiative, which is based in Lagos. They are a youth-led organization advancing gender equality and pushing to end sexual and gender-based violence through advocacy, prevention, and support. Their website is uh, standtoendreap.org. So um, that's the first one. The second one is JMMA on Social Menace, which is based in Kanu. Uh, their vision is to strive towards a greater Northern Nigeria where gender equality and social justice become the main catalyst that drive rapid integrated and emancipatory development. So this particular um, organization focused more on the uh, rural communities like um, Hajiya Fatima mentioned, uh, the extremely high cases uh, of rape and sexual violence in these parts. So this uh, organization in Kano, that's their main focus and they need more uh, support from youth, especially they need more youth members and they need uh, uh, shine more light on what they need people to join them and shine more light on what they're doing so that they can get more support. And then lastly, uh, we have the consent workshop, which is based in Abuja. And the consent workshop is a youth led nonprofit deconstructing rape culture through consent education resources and policy advocacy. Uh, so the consent workshop are also available on social media and they frequently report uh, the work that they are doing. In fact, they've also gone the distance of uh, working on a database of sex, uh, of sex offenders. So this database features people that have had, uh, 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 that have been reported as rapists, uh, confirmed cases, and uh, people that are general menaces to society because they have uh, participated one way or the other in sexual violence. So they've taken it the extra mile by working on a database. So uh, these are the three organizations that we wanted to list, but like we said, there's so many others out there. Please endeavor to do your own research and find out. Uh, I'd like to use this opportunity to thank 
uh, each and every one of you for your participation. Hajiya Fatima Hamza, thank you so much. Hajiya Saadatah Hassan Biman, thank you so much. And my sister Rukaya, thank you so much for all of your insights. We have learned so much today. Please, I hope that we continue to collaborate with more and more people that are pursuing this, uh, this, this problem. Uh, it's a societal problem. It's a problem that affects every single one of us, our children, our sisters, and even us and our sons. So um, may Allah be for all of you and may Allah reward all of you for your contributions today. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Salaamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Wish you all the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد ان لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك